So that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> so now we're gonna take it down a notch um, and talk about what we're doing at Boston Children's Hospital. <laughs> I have nothing to disclose. So there's about 7,000 rare diseases that um, have been more or less discovered and more being discovered every day. Around 80% are genetic and about 50% are pediatric in presentation, which is why they're very important to us at Boston Children's. And in the United States, about 25 to 30 million people are living with a rare disease. And outside of the US, it's 250 to 300 million. And when you have a rare disease, it's not often straightforward. You have seven to 12 years to diagnosis on average, eight specialty physicians, two or three misdiagnoses. And in Howard's wonderful talk yesterday, we heard how physicians don't have the time or information they need. And all of this combines and makes a major emotional toll on patients and caregivers. One such orphan disease is juvenile onset psychosis. So some people who go on to develop schizophrenia functioned relatively well when they were young. Though for others, there's nonspecific early risk indicators. Developmentally inappropriate anxiety or social communication problems, for example. And however, around adolescence, something begins to change. Many um, experience depression, trouble concentrating, or even subclinical psychotic-like symptoms, such as hearing noises they recognize that aren't real or feeling a little paranoid or having trouble speaking clearly. That's known as the prodromal period. Then later in young adulthood, a person might experience their first psychotic episode. They could have a dramatic increase or decrease in functioning and often get hospitalized. With treatment, many recover, but many um, experience subsequent episodes and never return to their previous level of functioning. And there's a small group that do, and one of the things that predicts um, better outcomes is getting into treatment early. So at the Developmental Neuropsychiatry Program at Boston Children's, we're evaluating children's, uh, children at risk for developing psychosis. We're doing deep phenotyping and behavioral phenotyping to characterize biomarkers. Then we're doing genotyping, combining the two, um, and then whenever possible, getting um, neur um, stem cells with the goal of being able to screen compounds and create animal models and um, work towards a disease in a dish, incorporate the biomarkers, and then most importantly, to in integrate what we learn in research back into the clinic in real time and, incorporate and um, improve treatments. And using juvenile onset psychosis, we're at a unique advantage. So just like studying Mendelian forms of, rare Mendelian forms of disease helps us find new genes for conditions. Studying the youngest affected children help us find highly penetrant genes. Same with working with their, their neuronal scale, cell cultures. So for genotyping here, we try to get at least trios. Oftentimes that's not possible, but we get trios and more than trios whenever possible. We do whole exome and genome sequencing in com combination with chromosomal microarray. Of course, ideally, we would like genome on everybody, but financial constraints and hospital reimbursement play a part. And then we store DNA and whatever biological materials we can get um, in our biorepository, and we enroll the patients in the Manton Center for Orphan Disease Research. And though it's a big ask for, for young children with um, psychosis, we try and get stem cells. And we've had success with this approach. For example, in this case, we have a nine-year-old boy with no um, complications in pregnancy. Um, though mom was given sertraline at the very end. At five, had elevated blood lo lead levels, but the parents moved and the blood levels returned to normal. Intermittent, intermittent exotropia or strabismus. Um, history of problems with motor co coordination and spoke a bit late, three years for the first phrases, or 4.5 years for the first phrases. And at nine, was supposed, found to have below average nonverbal and spatial reasoning had frequent tantrums with screening episodes and physical aggression, started very young, but at age six began to have hallucinations and delusions, eventually proceeded 
auditory, visual, and tactile hallucinations. And I stress the importance here. The most common question I get is, how do you know they're actually psychotic? And it's not just having a particularly aggressive imaginary friend or something. And the, so we try to make sure that we have of um, uh, um, uh, history of what they are experiencing to truly show that they are indeed psychotic. Um, the hallucinations um, responded to treatment, um, and for family history, it was probable but that the father had schizophrenia and mother had a history of depression and anxiety, and the child had a copy number loss at 16P13.11. Um, the mother didn't have the deletion, and the father was not available for her testing, so it was either paternal or de novo, likely paternal, since the father was thought to have schizophrenia. For case number two, it was a five-year-old girl with indications of having epilepsy around 18 months, the first tonic-clonic seizure at 35 months. The seizures became under control with lamotrigine, had also a KRE1 malformation, and exotropia, again, strabismus. Um, delayed developmental milestones, walking, um, well, at nine months, but the first words were at 2.5 years, and the first phrase is at three, three years, um, and responded well to early intervention in ABA. But here, the visceral hallucinations began at four years with paranoid behavior, seeing a wolf in the room, um, people covered in blood, spiders in her ears, and the symptoms decreased in frequency with risperidone um, and also um, became almost totally controlled and with addition of haloperidol. But the family had a history of idiopathic seizures. Um, the, fa uh, the father had photosensitive epilepsy. Um, and this child had a copy gain at the same interval as the last child who had the deletion at 16P13.11. And this is overlapping with the same three genes involved. And that gene is, those, that region is associated with normal onset schizophrenia, N10-1 and NDE-1 were named as candidate genes, and along with having copy number variations in general is associated with having schizophrenia. Um, so, but for, a ch for children this young to be presenting, that was novel, so we published this, which came out this month. And we were thinking, that genomic region is also associated with developmental delay, microcephaly, epilepsy, short stature, facial dysmorphism, and behavioral problems. Perhaps there were other children at Boston Children's who had 16P13.11 aberrations. Um, the electronic medical record isn't designed for genomic queries. It's getting better, but it's not ideal. Um, at Children's were lucky in terms that we spun out our clinical laboratory and in conjunction with Life Technologies and now Wuxi Nexcode, we formed Claritas Genomics and they're the preferred provider of genomic services. So we're able to ask Claritas, hey, how many children, um, within the constraints of our IRB of course, how many children have aberrations at 16.13.11 and, and get the list of the MRNs. So Claritas did the big query of the big data and got us um, three families with the same 16P13.11 deletion for a total of four families. And they had had chromosomal, chromosomal microarrays for different reasons. Uh, one was dysregulated behavior, learning problems. The second, microcephaly and learning problems. Third, intellectual disability and seizures. And then the parents were also tested when the children came out as having uh, a deletion. Then we looked at the medical records. Two out of the three of the new probands had had symptoms of psychosis, and two out of two parents with the deletion when it was inherited had a history of psychosis. So for one of the ch children, uh, we enrolled in the psychiatry program, and they're actually responding quite, quite well to treatment. We can consider that one a success story, but the second case is a little more com uh, complicated. So patient number three and his father. It's a 22-year-old male with a history of microcephaly, learning disability, and epilepsy. The father had a history of bipolar disorder, seizures, learning disability, and other mental disorders. The child walked at 15 months, had delayed development, and was um, in physical and occupational therapy, and had epilepsy since age two. And, the and both he and his father were found to have the 16P um, deletion. The father was able to hold down a job, um, but he had long-standing difficulties with judgment and impulsivity. Now, at age 47 years, he was treated with Adderall, 
and because he wasn't responding, the dose was increased to 80 milligrams per day, which is twice the FDA usual maximum dose. So at age 47, he had a manic psychotic break with symptoms that persist long after stopping Adderall. Um, with, and he lists here some of the examples of the psychotic behavior. Currently, he's taking um, psychos um, uh, antipsychotic and doing better, but still not completely functional. Then, after the father broke, uh, within eight months into the father's psychotic break, the son started having symptoms of psychosis, he started hearing voices, was hospitalized, and he was refractory to treatment, didn't seem to be controlled on any antipsychotic. Finally, we found one that sort of worked, um, doesn't um, report auditory or visual hallucinations, but does believe that they were real in the past. And both Proban and his father are doing better now. But when the father had his, -psychotic, or his psychotic break, it was extremely stressful for the family. At one point, he was asked to leave the home. So that, that both the parents believe that the stress of the father's psychosis triggered the son's psychotic episode. We got there too late. If we knew then what we know now, we would have had the, prevent, um, the potential to prevent the psychotic break. Maybe we wouldn't have, but we would have been much better equipped. Had the father psychiatrist known of the increased risk, you wouldn't prescribe twice the dose of Adderall. And age 47 is extremely late for a psychotic, first psychotic break. And if, he hadn't, if the son hadn't been under so much stress, he probably wouldn't have broken. And even if the father did have the psychotic break and we knew that the son had that deletion, we would have been able to uh, mitigate the stress and provide much better support. So how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? I mean, we can do the typical things, like provide access to papers, contact other chromosomal microarray labs, contact other medical centers, um, have a Facebook page, um, and then also make sure to offer um, parents and offer clinical consultations, preventative advice, and monitoring of their patients. And also, we can do better mental health screening uh, throughout the hospital. So for those symptoms that could um, indicate a 16P aberration, we can do mental health screening. Um, so uh, for um, uh, in epilepsy or in some of the other clinics, we can ask if um, the questions that are actually quite sensitive for determining whether a mental health screening is warranted and um, put that in the intake form. We can, but what about those patients that aren't at Children's? Well, we're working on that too. At the BCH Innovation Team, we are collaborating with Inspire, which is the world's largest patient discussion forum. And we have pilots now in a few um, conditions and try and use things like surveys and natural language processing um, and text mining in order to find patients at risk and offer support. So big data, queries of big data can inform medical care, but it's tricky. Again, most EMRs are not geared for easy searching of genetic findings, and some are better than others. Some allow for free text searching, but that's not a magic bullet. And alert fatigue is a very real thing. We're currently working with Claritas to figure out the best way to implement this. Ideally, when a new discovery comes online, the data would be rerun and a report reissued and uh, make sure that the clinicians all know. But that doesn't happen automatically yet. So it's at least, it's easier, at least right now, for us to get an alert and make sure that the parties that are invested in this know to contact and do the heavy lifting to contact the patient. We also know that mental health disorders are quite unique. The symptoms can often go unnoticed, as they did in the one patient that we discussed. Even the success story, the, the uh, prodromal symptoms were not being addressed because they were much less serious than the epilepsy that was being treated. And the cost of the psychotic, uh, uh, psychotic break is extremely high. And again, the father and son that we identified too late have not returned to a normal level of functioning. But it isn't impossible. At Children's, we have a 22Q clinic. Um, we know that those patients are about 25% likely to 
go on to develop psychosis. And um, this clinic offers unique and tailored treatment to minimize that likelihood. So we can do the same for 16P, 13.11, and other disorders. We just need the infrastructure to do these big queries in real time and the, in and the infrastructure to act on it, and we're working on it. So a thank you to many people that we work with and many others. And thanks so much.